for Hudson. Yeah, that's a, that's an upgrade for me. <laughs> well, this is really an exciting night for all of us, especially the, the Betty Gibson lecture series. It's always very near and dear to me. This is the 26th year that we are able to do this, which is just phenomenal. It was started 26 years ago by Matt Gibson. We've got a great showing of Gibsons here tonight. Um, so Sheila is Betty's daughter. Stephen Gibson is her son. Sharon Daniel is her daughter. We've got Phil Moss, she was husband, and two grandchildren here tonight, Whit and Melissa. So glad to have you all. And her cousin, Brenda Nottingham. So we've got a great showing of the Gibsons, and we're just excited yeah, to have you all. And this is going to be a great program tonight as well. <coughs> Jeff Lemming, who I think we all know, we especially know at Mr. Kingsport, my son, retired <laughs> in 2019 you. after a 35 year career in city government, arising from a planning intern to city manager. He's a passionate advocate for our community, especially the Move to Kingsport program, which he helped create in 1999 to combat population decline and boost economic growth. Jeff has been recognized for his leadership, earning the Northeast Tennessee Hospitality Professional of the Year Award in 2022. The Lifetime Service Awards from the Kingsport Chamber, Visit Kingsport, and Leadership Kingsport. His academic background includes a bachelor's degree in political science, engineering technology, and a master's in geography, urban planning from East Tennessee State University. He's an eternal optimist, history buff, a self-proclaimed data nerd, using his platform to inspire the next generation. Jeff and Christy married 38 years ago, had two adult children and two granddaughters in the door. His commitment to our community service extends to several volunteer boards, and he does meals on wheels. So we're really excited to have him tonight in our program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer Hudson. I'll mention this a couple of times, but if you enjoy the short stories that you're going to hear tonight and want to follow along, you can go to kingsportspirit.com and you can follow along, you can sign up, you can just visit periodically if you want to, but uh, you'll find much more content like this. Uh, any little fun fact or tidbit that I find, I will share it uh, there. And so uh, please feel free to check that out. Of course, it's free and there's no charge. So obviously tonight we're here to honor Betty Gibson in the memorial lecture, and so um, I'm thrilled that Jennifer introduced the family. I, I really delved in a little bit into some of the family history and wrote an article uh, that is the first article you will find on kingsportspirit.com if you go there right now. And it talks about the probably the most famous person I was not aware of, and that's Rogan Showalter, who lost his life tragically um, back home after surviving World War One. Of course, at the time it was known as the Great War because we hadn't had a World War II yet. And uh, he was one of the first to volunteer. He survived with shrapnel. Um, and then uh, he was hospitalized in, in Europe. He was one of the first Americans to go overseas to fight. And, and like I say, tragically lost his life. Betty was four years old when he died. And um, so as I was going through the newspaper and I was researching her life and finding out little tidbits, of course, back in those days, the society page reported everything. You know, so apparently Betty excelled in kindergarten. <laughs> and it went on to talk about the little girl birthday parties and who attended. And, and uh, I was just reading it thinking if I was a father reading and I was passed and I was reading about that my little girl growing up, how proud I would have been. I couldn't help but think how proud he would have been of, of how, who, her and how she turned out. And her love for history and her early influence in establishing the Netherlands Inn Association and preserving that legacy. And, and that is carried on today through her family. And so we really, really appreciate that. Appreciate y'all um, sponsoring this. So as Jennifer said, my background is in city planning. And so I, I love to figure out how the relationship between the built environment and people, how that works out, uh, why it happens, how it happens, how it's planned, how it's laid out. So some of the questions that, you know, I probably should have thought a long time ago 
when I was actually working for the city. Uh, but you don't have time to do that when you're working. Um, I, I started thinking about, you know, there's really a tale of two cities. There's the boatyard, which is the original Kingsport, and there is the model city, and they're about 100 years apart. So I wonder what the conditions were when the folks came in to start buying land and assembling property. What was here? What was left? I always heard the story that, you know, Kingsport was the most important um, geographic location in Northeast Tennessee for years and years because it was the place where you could go and float your goods down the river uh, in wet weather, at least, when, when the river was high enough. Um, but then the railroad came along, and uh, if you've heard me talk to civic clubs, you've heard me tell the story. Um, the folks from Johnson City and Jonesboro and Bristol came over and said, hey, y'all have got a river, and we don't. If you'll support us building the railroad through our town, we'll support dredging the river for you all. And, of course, we know what happened with river traffic after that, and that was the last time we trusted anybody in Johnson City and Bristol <laughs> for Jonesboro. So, so literally, there was nothing left of Kingsport after World War. I mean, after the Civil War, it just pretty much dried up and blew away. There weren't enough people left to even apply for their charter again. So, uh, while the city was incorporated in 1822, it lost its charter after the Civil War, and um, and folks, you know, lost families, they lost businesses, um, they went into distress with their properties, and they many of them moved along to other areas. So that set the stage for these newcomers to come in and see what uh, was available. So what were the development patterns prior to the model city? What were the original limits of the model city and what neighborhoods sprung up just outside the city limits, which some of which were later annexed? And what are some of the homes that preceded the model city? Now, obviously, I can't cover all the homes, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the, the old Kingsport boatyard area simply because it's been so well covered by Muriel Spoden, and I would encourage you to check those books out and and see what all she's written about that. I use a lot of her materials, but uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the obvious houses, but I'm going to try to talk about some that may not be so obvious. Um, who founded modern Kingsport and what national trends influenced them? What were they thinking when they came south and they started putting property together? And then what does the evolution of neighborhoods look like from 1917 to 1959? So I'm going to be doing a follow-up from 1959 forward at the Kingsport Historical Society in spring but we're going to stop for now in the, in the mid-century 50s. So much of present Kingsport was outside the city limits. So if you look at the basic uh, property that was acquired to build the town, it pretty much followed the ridge along Reedy Creek. It went over to what we know now as Eastman Road. It went south to the edge of the Holston River, and then it went over to about where um, Riverside Avenue and Fairview Avenue go up to Westview Park on the west. Anything outside that boundary was outside the original city limits. And if you if you could see it, I'm not sure you can, but right in here, it's a straight line from over in Highland, Indian Highland Park, to straight over to Gibson Mill. Anything north of that, including Jim Wright's house, Mayor Scholl's house, was outside the city limits. Fair, Fair Ridge Drive was outside the city, at the original city at the time. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then when you look at uh, the road network, you see uh, Netherland End Road, which was the Lee Highway, the Knox Hill Highway. Lynn Garden Drive was the Scott County Road. Uh, Bloomingdale Pike was the Reedy Creek Road. And um, Orbank and Warpath were aligned at the time. And I actually went back and triple checked that because it doesn't, it, in my mind, they don't line up. But even if you go to Google Maps right now and you took out Memorial Boulevard, they do align. You could just go right straight up Warpath Drive and and kind of just bear and keep going up Warbank um, past Exchange Place. So that led to the River's Edge, which was where Fort Robinson was, which later became Fort Patrick Henry. So that was the reason why there was a Warpath Drive leading, leading to that location. Then, of course, you had the Horse Creek Road, which we know as Wilcox Drive or Solon Gardens Parkway or Eastman Road that, it, that went out to the point southwest. So there are these maps called Sanborn maps, which are fire insurance maps, and they are a tremendous resource to be able to go back and reconstruct what happened. Because back in the day, that's all they had to reference, you know, what, what a firefighter might come upon in the event of an emergency as to what's stored in the building, what exists there. And these are all over the country. So uh, some of these I found even in the Library of Congress. So if you want to find other cities, like I, I did some exploring in downtown Knoxville and Pretty cool to go back and look at the areas that were where they had the horses and the livery stables and things like that that are mentioned on those maps. 
So there were uh, key sections in 1916, the pulp village and extract village, um, the, um, the manufacturing area of the tannery, the extract, the pulp area, cement, brick, and um, you know, I started thinking, if I was building a city, what things do you need to build cities? Let's see, bricks, concrete, <laughs> you know, there, that's, that's what you need to, to build. And so that's, there was a real logic behind what they built to start the community. Um, the Oak Street Corridor, which to me, Oak Street is, is a much more tertiary street now. But back in those days, Oak Street was seen as a centerpiece for that particular neighborhood. And then the Five Points neighborhood extended all the way down from Market Street up to uh, what we would call Watauga Circle or Ravine Road to today. And then you had the radial streets. Um, and then you had the area right at the brown on the bottom right, right near uh, um, Main Street, the 100 and 200 blocks of, of all the streets coming off of Main. So Polk Village and Extract Village were new to me, um, and I was trying to figure out how to explain which is which. So sleep track was related to um, tanning leather, which was given to slipknot belting to make belts, and those belts were used to, uh, to support all the manufacturing processes and machinery that was going on in Kingsport. So there were all these interlocking industries that were happening, but they didn't have any houses here. So if they, if they built a plant, they had to have a place for the employees to live. So virtually every industry built their own, like workman's village to live in, a company town, if you will. And that's why they, they existed like that. So Polk Village and Extract Village are, are Arch Street and Branch Street and Roller Street. Um, now, I couldn't tell you which is a pulp and which is extract, but they were very clear to uh, say that there was a difference. Carrying that forward to 1919, so just three years later, you see the map gets a lot more complicated, right? You've got the Watauga Street area has now separated from five points. The Oak Street area has now picked up White City. And then you have Brickyard Row. Now tomorrow there's going to be a great big ribbon cutting and or, or groundbreaking for Brickyard development. And in 1919, there was already a Brickyard Row that was existing at the time. So we're really just kind of going back to the future, which I think is pretty cool. It's also Holston Heights had emerged by that time on Cement Hill. Um, I remember going back to Google Maps at some point saying, you know, I realize you have it labeled as Holston Heights, but I don't know anybody that references it as Holston Heights anymore. But Holston Heights was a big deal back in the day because that's where a lot of the social activities took place. There are lots of references of the Johnson City Orchestra coming over and performing at the, the club on top of Holston Heights and uh, the views of Bays Mountain that they mentioned. And, you know, none of us had ever really seen those views, at least not in my lifetime, until the Brickyard Park project got started, and now you can go over to the baseball fields and kind of get a view of what they were seeing, and you realize how beautiful that whole area actually is. By 1925, you see it's starting to get a little more complex with Severe Terrace pops up, Jackson Heights, uh, Gibson Town shows up for the first time, and the Dobbins Edition, which is the predecessor to Fair Acres, Borden Village shows up, and then you also see Corning is on there, and uh, Eastman, and Edgewood Village, and Beechwood Village. Edgewood Village and Beechwood Village were the company housing for Eastman, uh, or some of the company housing for Eastman. So what were the de development patterns prior to the model city? So if you kind of squint your eyes and pretend like the red roads don't exist right there, that's what it would have looked like at the beginning. So you had the Reed Creek Road going to Bloomingdale. You had uh, the Stage Road or uh, going to Bluntville in Bristol. And you had the Lee Highway going to Knoxville. You had the Scott County Road going to Gate City, and then you had the Horse Creek Road going to Greenville, Jonesboro, and Johnson City. And they all converged along Sullivan Street right in the middle of downtown Kingsport. So you notice that split going to Bristol and Johnson City is right there in the middle of town. Uh, pay attention to that because I'm going to come back to it. So some of the aha moments I had is that when you look at the alignment of Memorial Boulevard as we know it today, and back in those days, it came down what we know as Center Street. It didn't go down the four-lane piece next to the mall. That didn't exist at the time. And then Warpath Drive was there, and it extended south toward the river. Look at the configuration of that blue compared to that red. It's pretty much like they just took that intersection and then stretched it over a little further northeast. So, so Memorial Boulevard would have been as significant as Stone Drive in those days in terms of traffic and commercial activity and so forth. John B. Dennis would have been comparable to Warpath Drive at the time, or vice versa. So you, you see how shifting that traffic can really change the development pattern um, of the city. 
the fork at Center Street and Sullivan Street, as we know it now, would have been the main split between the Bristol Highway and the Johnson City Highway at the time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Federal Club or the Union Club in a minute that existed at the intersection of what we know today as Sullivan Street and Wilcox Drive. Um, and you, you think, why would they build a hotel out there? Well, at that time, that was the main highway to Johnson City. So it was a major gateway into town. Now everything goes a different direction up toward, toward Center Street. But that, that Y intersection pretty much got shifted over to the Fort Henry Drive Center Street split. So that intersection that we know today would have been in the, as prominent back in the early stages of Kingsport um, as it, as it uh, you know, is now. Another key moment, uh, uh, aha moment, is that the intersection of the Scott County Road, the Knoxville Highway, the Reedy Creek Road, and Sullivan Street would have been the most important node at that time. Well, that node now is I-26 at Stone Drive. It got shifted over. So you, you can kind of see how there was a, an area in the middle of town that got developed, and then over time, it got expanded out uh, to accommodate the growth um, of the city. The road to Johnson City was historically called the Horse Creek Pike, and, and sometimes it was called Horse Creek Road, the Horse Creek Pike. And it went out, um, and it, and it kind of, it didn't exactly follow Lincoln Street, but it almost did. And then it, it veered down what we would know as Southeast Monroe and went on out into Sullivan Gardens toward Greenville and Jonesboro and Johnson City. Um, it was changed to East Monroe, the name, in 1953. And in 1914, a new bridge was built just a little further west, and they called that Long Island Drive. And it was changed to Wilcox Drive in 1953. So you can see as Eastman starts to grow and, and as the city needs more connectivity to the south, um, new roads were added and then names were changed to make, make it all make sense. So what neighborhoods sprung up just outside the city limits, some of which were later annexed? I had an old planning professor that used to tell me, pay attention to if the, if the building is sitting on the street and looks like it, it belongs downtown, chances are that was a village that preceded the city. And so when you go down um, Center Street, just past the Indian Highland Park or Dobbins Bennett, you'll see a bunch of buildings that are right up on Center Street. Well, that was Highland Park. And Highland Park was outside the city at that time. Uh, Hillcrest, you know, those buildings have just recently been demolished to make way for widening of Memorial Boulevard, but deals for covering uh, that whole area that looked like a little downtown, that was sort of downtown Hillcrest. Um, uh, Litz Manor, um, Shelton Clark grew up in Litz Manor. I did a piece on kingsportspirit.com about Litz Manor, and, and uh, it was really it was interesting to find out how J. Fred Johnson was trying to figure out how to manage growth inside the city limits, but all these neighborhoods were springing up outside, and they weren't part of the city, but they needed services. And so J. Fred Johnson aligned with Mr. Litz to go to Blunt Bowl and ask for them to step up and provide some services for Litz Manor children. And then a few years later, it was annexed, but uh, you know they, they tried to help each other as neighbors. But Litz Manor grew up as its own freestanding community. It had its own school, um, and, uh, and it was not part of the city of Kingsport. Of course, Colonial Heights is a much more recent example, um, but it has its own little business district. Long Island was just across the river, and um, as I think we all know, Long Island was a pretty lawless place <laughs> because it was just outside the jurisdiction of the city. and. Uh, of course, that's where Long Island tea was invented and many other things I understand. So, uh, <laughs> and then Sullivan Gardens, uh, a little further out, but it also had its own little village node. Fort Robinson had its own little village node. If you go up Fort Robinson Drive today, right across from Fort Robinson uh, Baptist Church, there's a, a group of buildings that looks like a little downtown Fort Robinson. And, and just down from there was actually the original Kingsport High School that was built by Sullivan County. Uh, before the new city of Kingsport existed. So that was really the original Kingsport High School. And then Lynn Garden and Bloomingdale to the north, similarly, um, you, you see those little nodes. And those all grew up without, um, there weren't land use codes. There, weren't, there, wasn't, there wasn't zoning in Sullivan County until I came to work. So up until the 80s, there was no zoning in Sullivan County. And uh, there were barely subdivision regulations. So when you go into Lynn Garden and, and you, it looks kind of chaotic, the way the roads are laid out, that's what happens if you don't try to manage your growth, you know, and uh, and so that was one of the reasons why it was important to be inside the city limits. So what are the, some of the homes, the individual homes that existed um, in the model city? Obviously, Rotherwood, that didn't translate very well. 
Sorry, that font didn't work. Uh, Rotherwood was built in 1818 by uh, Reverend Frederick Ross. Uh, I found it interesting that uh, Pendleton, Edmund Pendleton, um, well, Pendleton, I'm not sure if Edmund was his first name, but Pendleton had the land tract uh, that was most of Kingsport um, along Reedy Creek. And it was granted by the governor of Virginia. Well, think about it for a minute. His land grant came from the governor of Virginia, but we were in North Carolina, but they didn't know at the time. So when they started uh, trying to figure out which state was which, uh, Pendleton kind of panicked and he sent an agent to Raleigh to try to get his grant recognized and it finally, after years, was recognized. And so then immediately, once it was recognized as being an official grant, he turned around and sold it all off to different people. And David Ross, uh, uh, Re Frederick Ross being his son, was one of the ones that bought it. Um, so when you look at the Ross family, like who are they? So uh, Ross was from Central Virginia, and he was one of the uh, biggest iron um, guys at the, of the day. And I kept thinking, what is iron? What's, what was so important about iron at the time? Because you hear that all the time. Well, iron, Great Britain had realized that they didn't have the natural resource of iron, which is what you use to make cannonballs and bullets. And so they were on an island and didn't have a resource, so they pretty much sent word over saying, anybody that can supply us with iron, you know, we'll buy it. And so everybody went out trying to find iron in every direction. And of course, it was also used for other things like nails and things like that. But, but they had a, uh, you know, as much iron as they could produce, they could sell it to Great Britain. So Ross became a very wealthy person in Virginia, and he kept trying to expand his interests a little further south into uh, what became Tennessee. Ironically, Ross had a, you can go look on Google even today, there is a house that he owned near Lynchburg called Mount Ida. And I'll tell you more in a minute, but the Severe Mansion, as we know it on Severe Terrace Drive, is called Mount Ida. So you wonder if that's how he, he got that. So uh, Frederick Ross was the one that tried to uh, really become an entrepreneur. He wanted to do the mulberry trees. He wanted to do the silk, uh, make, make silk and so forth. And there's lots of national publications about the quality of this product. And, and he almost made it, but he didn't make it. And so in, in the meantime, his overseer was Joshua Phipps. And so um, Frederick Ross ended up basically losing his property because he was so focused on silk production that Phipps stepped in and took over, took over the property. And so Phipps owned the property forever. And, and he, was, he was described as being a very um, evil man, a very evil overseer. And so if you follow any of the Rotherwood ghost stories, he's the, he's the origin of that. Was, he's the, the mean guy, is the Phipps. So in 1906, George L. Carter, who bought all the property for Kingsport, bought the property, and it was occupied by James Dobbins, which eventually became our first mayor, of course. In 1916, John B. Dennis bought the property and lived in it for a while. And, and if, if you, you can go find on kingsportspirit.com the story of Jill Ellis, and I love that story. Uh, she told it herself, and I just basically captured what she said and wrote it down. But uh, Jill's family were the caretakers, uh, the butler and the driver, for um, Mr. Dennis at Rotherwood. And uh, she was known as the little girl. He just called her little girl all the time. And he said, but she said he would come in and say, read little girl, read. And she said, I just did anything he said. And I read and I read and I read. And became, she became so educated. And he would give her his pocket change over the summer before he would go back to New York. And she saved all that up. Um, and so she had a, you know, just talked about with such fondness, everything that she heard about growing up in Rotherwood. But John B. Dennis ended up, when World War II broke out, uh, Hunter Wright did a whole presentation on this. Um, the Army basically came in and said, we don't really want to get involved in World War II. So the best thing that we can do is help the British stabilize Royal Defense Explosive, which is RDX. And RDX is the most, most uh, powerful non-nuclear um, bomb that you can make, basically. And they needed a place to do that. And they said Eastman had all the chemical experience. So they said, Eastman, we want you to take one for the team. We want you to stabilize RDX for the, for the British. So Eastman went to work to stabilize it. They did a pilot plant, and they proved that they could do it. They did a second pilot plant and produced even more. And then they said, OK, we need you to go full-scale production. And so they had to find thousands of acres and a place to do this. And John B. Dennis owned Rotherwood Farm now, which was 6,000 acres. 
And so he sold it to the army with a reversionary clause. And uh, so everything that used to be Rotherwood Farm became uh, Holston Defense. And so listening to Hunter's presentation and all that Kingsport went through in World War II to try, you know, for the good of the country, you, you, if you could roll back time and think, what if World War II hadn't happened, what would Rotherwood Farm look like today? You know, instead of a bomb factory, would it be houses? Would it, what would it be? And, uh, but Kingsport really sacrificed a lot for the good of the country. So John B. Dennis, as you can imagine, after the war, he got the property back. But how would you, you know, he raised Jersey cattle. And so if you got the property back and you're looking in your backyard and it's, it's all, you know, an army ammunition plant, he's like, you know, he moved to Biltmore Village and uh, that's where he died in Asheville. And his wife continued to live there until till she passed away as well. So in 1945, John B. Dennis sold it to Herb Stone. It was sold at auction to, to Sam Pickering in 1980, and Roger Ball bought it in 1984. And Dr. Lanita Tabot has been there since 1991, and she spent seven years meticulously uh, redoing the property and renovating it. And so we owe her a great debt of gratitude for preserving a very uh, legacy property. The Peach House, uh, I, I added this slide because of relationship to, uh, to Betty Gibson that we talked about. This is the house that you'll see if you walk on the green belt. And um, it has been beautifully restored. I think John Scott, I think, did two of the houses down there and lived in it for a while. Um, it recently sold, I believe, to a family from Florida. But as I started trying to learn more about Betty, um, I realized that this is where the Showalters lived. And that the Showalters originally, the I don't know what the great-grandfather or whatever, lived on Rotherwood Farm. And so when his son was born, they named him Charlie Phipps Showalter. Now, there's no evidence I can find that there was any blood relation to uh, the Phipps that owned the property. But nevertheless, his name was Charlie Phipps, and CP was uh, his, what he went by. So he went to work helping build the Clinchville Railroad. And, and uh, the family story, uh, which is in your handout if you have one, talks about how he would come down the railroad tracks, which was just right across Nedlin End Road from the house. And he would blow the horn to let the family know he was okay. Well, he had, they had two sons initially, twins. Uh, one survived, James Rogan, Showalter. And uh, Rogan is the one that volunteered for World War I and came back and was tragically killed. Uh, Rogan Showalter married Cleo Blank Blankenbeckler, who's kin to Jitney Blankenbeckler. And their daughter, Betty Jo Showalter, married Matt Bo Gibson. And Betty Gibson is why we're here today. So now you know the rest of the story. So Severe Terrace, this is Mount Ida. So if you are coming down Severe uh, Sullivan Street, excuse me, at Lynn Garden Drive, and you're just barely off Lynn Garden Drive, there's a street called Mount Ida Place. And if you pause real quickly, don't, not too long because we'll get rear-ended, but if you pause just real quickly and look straight up Mount Ida Place, it's lined up with the center of the Mount Ida uh, mansion up there. So Mount Ida, uh, the log house was built in 1790. Now think about it. When was Tennessee, when did it become a state? 1796. So this was before uh, Tennessee was a state. For David Ross, who I mentioned, who ran a nearby iron furnace, his heirs sold the property to David D. Severe in Annis, Netherland um, in 1817. And the Severs lived in that log house for a time until they built the comfortable brick house in 1884. So again, if Kingsport was incorporated in 1917, modern Kingsport, this was well before. And that was one of the main um, you know, directions that, that Kingsport was growing. And I really apologize, this pump didn't work out the way it was intended to. But if you look at Robert Severe, so he was born in 1749 and he died at 1780 at Kings Mountain. So he was the brother of John Severe, who later became the governor of Tennessee. He married Keziah Robertson, who was born in 1753 and died in 1806. She is the sister of James Robertson, who was the founder of Nashville. Okay, so if you have not seen it, I would encourage you to go see the Liberty play at Sycamore Shoals. I'm ashamed to say I saw it for the first time just a couple of years ago. It's well worth it. And it ties together all the names that were right here in this area that ended up becoming instrumental in founding of Tennessee. Um, so Robert and Keziah's son, Valentine Sevier V, was born in 1780. Now, why is that circle? His dad died in 1780 at Kings Mountain, and he was born in 1780, so clearly she was pregnant before he left, but and so he never knew his father. Uh, he died in Greene County in 1854, 
uh, he married Nancy Dinwiddie. They had David Dedrick Severe, uh, 1821 to 1890, who died in Kingsport. He married Annis Rutledge Netherland, 1825 to 1898. She's the daughter of Richard Netherland and Netherland Inn. They had a daughter named Nellie Severe, who married Henry William Roller. If you've ever heard of Kingsport and you've heard of Roller, you know that Roller owned most of the property that was Kingsport, the Roller family in some way, shape, or form. And uh, so the Severe family married into the Roller family, and then they had two sons, William Roller Jr. and David Severe Roller. A lot of times you would just see them as D&W Roller or DS Roller. They didn't really say Severe, but his name was David Severe Roller. But David Severe Roller had no children, and William Roller Jr., had no biological children. He died in, in 1971, and David Severe Roller died in 1959. So the property that became Kingsport ended up being purchased from, uh, or much of the property from that those two uh, fellows. This property is on the corner of Clinchfield Street and Stone Drive. Uh, the address is technically 774 Bloomingdale Pike because Rita Gross close threatened their lives if we didn't keep it that way. So we did. And, uh, um, it was, even if you go on Zillow, it says it was built in 1861, which I think is pretty cool that Zillow is up to date like that. Uh, the log house dates back to Captain Joseph Everett's purchase from the David Ross heirs. So again, David Ross had a lot of property down through there. Martin Roller bought the plantation from Everett, the Everett heirs in 1852, and four years later sold it to Joseph Gross Close Sr. for $4,000. In 1856, Gross Close began construction of the Brick Mansion. The Civil War interrupted the construction and the, the long gallery two-story black back L was not completed until 1886. So the house was inherited by M.C. Grossclose, who married Gladys Roller. <laughs> there you go. Daughter of R. Pierce and Mary Kay Hitsworth Roller. So there you go. Uh, the cabin built in 1819 and the house built uh, in 1861. Right across from Holston Medical Group, of all places. 2320 Ridgefield or Pendragon Road in Ridgefields. So um, I, I, a lot of y'all may remember this house. I don't remember it. Apparently it was standing uh, when they built the clubhouse for the golf club. And um, the big white house uh, it was, showed up in the Times News in 1953 as being featured by the Tennessee Society of Preservation of Antiquities. And um, it was the home of Mr. and Mrs. C.P. Edwards, which of course is Valerie Yeo's parents. Right, I think, and um, and that it was the epicenter of the Ridgefields farm. And so, if you came across the ferry and went up to the top of the hill, that's where that house sat. That house was built in 1850 by none other than Martin Roller. Later, it was added to by his son William Roller upon his marriage to uh, Miss Nellie Severe. The present owners, Mr. and Mrs. Edwards, have made still further additions, among which are attractive stone terrace, which overlooks the Holston River. You can still see that eyebrow stone terrace on Google Earth. If you can look at it to this day, so that's still there. But the house is no longer there; it was removed, as I understand it, for expansion of the golf club house. This house is directly across from Great Body Company on Memorial Boulevard. Um, this is uh, built in 1840. So uh, as you drive down Moore Boulevard, you may not, you know, there's, it's hit and miss as to which uh, houses look historic and which ones look very modern. But this house kind of stands out to me. Um, it has recently been purchased um, and is being lovingly restored again by a local family. It's directly across the Great Body Company. It was the Enoch Shipley House. Think Shipley Ferry. So it was, uh, they are buried in Dixon Shipley Cemetery on Montclair Road. Montclair Road is right there overlooking Fort Patrick Henry Dam. That's that cemetery that's in the circle on Montclair Road. Um, so Shipley married Lucy Roller, a descendant of the Roller family who bought much of the original Pendleton grant that is now Kingsport. The Rollers owned Roller Petty John Mill off Fall Creek Road, and that is still in existence to this day. 1612 Watauga Street. So if you're driving down Watauga Street where uh, Center Street and Watauga come together and you kind of glance over, Paulette Fox had a bed and breakfast there recently. And uh, it's a beautiful home, uh, and it, it doesn't seem to fit at that particular location. But it was built in 1900. So again, it was 17 years before the city was incorporated. And at that time, Center Street didn't go down the direction it goes. It came down with August Street. So um, that where you kind of have to have that funny little turn, um, it was on the main path. It wasn't off the beaten path at all. It was right there on the main road. And uh, 
it was built by E.C. Barnes, um, which it happens to be the side street right there is Barnes Street. So you have Apollo Street and Barnes Street. So um, E.C. Barnes uh, built the house. I found his name mentioned in Cantrell, Tennessee, which is located along, uh, alongside Old Sullivan County names like Gunnings, Shipley, Droke, Hamilton, Har, Vance, Anderson, and Boer. So I don't know much about E.C. Barnes, but I'd like to. So if any of y'all know about E.C. Barnes, I'd love to know more about it. Highland Park, these houses are directly across from the back of DB. Um, I think one of those is Margaret Bay's house that she grew up in. And uh, each of those were built in 1900. So again, if you're coming down the main road from Bristol to Kingsport, which would have been Center Street and Watauga Street at the time, these houses pre-existed the city by 17 years. Gibson Town and Nelson Town. So these two homes uh, are still, these are recent examples. One is at 1010 Gibson Mill Road and one is at 1405 Rufus Road, um, built in 1900. Again, 17 years before the city existed. Um, but there has been a mill operating on that site since 1814, according to Mural Spoken. So that, that is a, another area that's kind of surrounded by Stone Drive and Fair Acres and the radial streets, but it really was its own freestanding little area that just kind of got grown around by the modern city of Kingsport. Um, I thought it was interesting that in the 1905 Nashville Banner, I found a reference to Gibson's Mill on Weedy Creek. Um, you know, you, you wouldn't think that it would be that significant, but it was even important enough to show up in the Nashville paper um, at the time. This is the Dobbins house in Fair Acres, as most of us know it is the Dobbins, Dobbins house. I, I believe the Wayne Case family owns it, and they are uh, really using it just to store um, antiques and preserve the house. But no one's actually living in it at this point. But it was the centerpiece of the plantation that covered all of Fair Acres. So Andrew Martin was married to Elizabeth Bachman, who was the daughter of the plantation owner. And Martin built this house in 1878, so shortly after the Civil War. Um, their family cemetery is the one that's on Linville Street, the one in the middle of the road on Linville Street. Most of most of us know it now as the 20th century home of our first mayor, James Dobbins. So who were the people behind the plan and what national trends influenced them? What was going through their mind when they came to Kingsport? So Kingsport was developed by New York's elite. I found it fascinating to go and look at the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from 1926 or 1915, and it mentioned... Colonel Theodore Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt will arrive in Oyster Bay next week after a short visit with Mr. and Mrs. John Barker at Past Christian, Mississippi. Mr. Barker is the bull moose leader of Louisiana. Among the members of the summer colony who have opened their homes um, are, it goes down and says, William Nichols, uh, Stuart Blackton, Albert Smith, et cetera, et cetera, James Blair, Blair and Company that formed that financed Kingsport, so James Blair and John B. Dennis. So they were, he was a neighbor to President Roosevelt in Oyster Bay. So Nichols, it turns out, was instrumental in building the chemical supply business in the United States. Hmm, that sounds kind of interesting to have a chemical plant here in Kingsport uh, when your neighbor was in that business in New York. Ledyard was the personal counsel to J.P. Morgan. Personal counsel to the original J.P. Morgan. Uh, Beekman, has, that name goes back to the founding of New Amsterdam. There's a Beekman Street in, down in, uh, near Wall Street. Gurney Sr. built the largest tannery in the West, and he was the 14th mayor of Chicago. There's actually a town called Gurney, Illinois, and he, re he retired back to New York. Um, Ingalls owned the Homestead Hot Springs Resort um, in Virginia. So, <laughs> um, and then Ingersoll invented the pocket watch. It was the first mass-produced pocket, pocket watch, including the Mickey Mouse watch. So uh, all these folks were just neighbors in New York. So a lot of it, you wonder, back in those days, you know, you couldn't just network virtually. You had to be kind of close to people that you could meet and interface and do business with. Um, so they weren't just venture capitalists and investors in Kingsport alone. They also had national and global interests. For example, the Chicago L. So back in those days, if you have a street that was called a pike or even railroads, Many of them were privately financed because the federal government and state governments hadn't gotten, hadn't gotten involved in road building at that time. They saw them as private. So if it's a pike, they would collect money and they would use that money from the various people who would benefit from the road and they would build the road and they called it pike. So there's lots of pikes. And then if you see when the pikes stop, like there's a lot in Knoxville, but not so many in Nashville, that means that by the time they got to Nashville, the government finally got involved and they didn't build pikes anymore. So it's a good tip to tell you uh, when that policy changed. So 
the transfer, of, this is the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1926, the transfer of the elevated lines to Blair and Company, Blair and Company who founded Kingsport, uh, according to one who had an active part in the negotiation, is the first step in a consolidation of all the elevated roads here. The deal puts the Northwestern, Lake Street, and Union Loop elevated roads under one control, and it will be necessary to acquire the Metropolitan and the Southside elevated roads. A consolidated plan, a consolidation has been attempted before, but without success. It has been a favorite scheme of Blair and Company, and it now, it's now believed they're in a position to carry it through. And who was the ringleader? Look at the bottom center. John B. Dennis. So who was John B. Dennis? So in the Tennessee and in 1910, uh, it, it published a, I believe this was a syndicated piece that talked about who were the seven future kings of, in the finance world. And those folks were uh, J. Pierpoint Morgan, J.P. Morgan, uh, Henry Davison, Otto Kahn, Mortimer Schiff, John B. Dennis, um, George Baker Jr., and James Stillman Jr. So who are those guys? So Davidson, Davison helped lay the foundation for the Federal Reserve. It, it, it talked about him going to St. Simon's Island and having a retreat with all these finance folks, and when it came out of it was what became the Federal Reserve. Kahn was best known as the partner in Kahn Loban Company who reorganized and consolidated all the railroads. Uh, Schiff, the family financed railroads, the Pennsylvania, the l and the B&O, and Westinghouse and Western Union, and helped govern the Union Pacific Railroad, Wells Fargo, and appointed and he was appointed to the original Federal Reserve Board. So, um, and then Stillman was the founder of Citibank. It was actually National Citibank at the time, but it became CITI Bank as we know it today. Um, and he also married descendants of the Carnegie and Rockefeller families. And then Baker was the Dean of American Banking. He's just the third richest man in America behind Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller. So the fact that John B. Dennis was mentioned in that same breath of those folks should let us know how prominent he was. Um, you know, he, he didn't have any heirs, he didn't have any children. So I'm, I'd love to know whatever happened to all of his money because it didn't end up in Kingsport, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, they recruited respected national architects to build model neighborhoods for different classes. Um, I'm just going to share real quickly that uh, Nolan's general plan for Kingsport acknowledged the centrality of industrial production, citing two linear industrial districts near rail lines on the south, near the edges of town. He planned residential areas in proximity to workplaces. More expensive areas of single family occupied the hills above the downtown and lower priced dwellings provided easy access to the manufacturing districts. All, as in all of his plans, Nolan reserved large green areas for parks. Just as Kistler, Nolan pr provided a, a hierarchical street network with wide boulevards in the central areas and then narrowed down to curving streets and alleys in the housing areas. Nolan worked very closely with Clinton McKenzie. Remember that, that name. He worked with uh, Clinton McKenzie um, for different uh, for residential areas for different classes. Armstrong Village housed unskilled workers in group homes. The 50s in White City offered cottages for skilled workers in a garden city setting. Remember that term too, garden city setting. While Orchard Court was modeled on upper middle class suburbs such as Forest Hills Gardens in Brooklyn. McKenzie, who designed buildings that ranged from impressive Georgian residences for local notables to the Kingsport Inn, was one of the most prominent architects the Kingsport Improvement Corporation brought to Kingsport. Others included Grosvenor, Atterbury, Thomas Hastings, and Electus D. Litchfield. That comes from the book Building the Working, Working Man's Paradise. So you know, we are in national publications uh, explaining how Kingsport was laid out. So I said Garden City Movement. So what is Garden City Movement? So remember back in the day, in fact, if you go to Manhattan to this day, it's 1st Street, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, you know, A, B, C, D, it's all grid. Everything is grid. And uh, they desperately wanted to get away from grid patterns and try to find a better way to build a city that was more palatable for living, not just for racing through on a straight street. And so uh, Ebenezer Howard, who was actually British, came up with the idea of a central city and radiating streets outwards where you'd have the tight commercial node in the middle and then you'd have the hinterlands, if you will, uh, on the outside. The garden cities would contain proportionate areas of residences, industry, and agriculture. Uh, he first uh, posted the idea in 1898 as a way to capture the primary benefits of the country and the city while avoiding the disadvantages presented by both. So 
Examples on the right would be Green Hills, Ohio, Greenbelt, Maryland, and Radburn, New Jersey. And you can see those street patterns kind of look sort of familiar to Kingsport, don't they, when you look at those. So pro tip, look for the term green, garden, field, forest, fair in the neighborhood, i.e. Garden Drive, Forest Street, Green Fields, Green Acres, Garden Apartments, Fair Acres, Ridgefields, for example. All of those were built on the non-grid pattern. They were trying to have curvilinear streets, large yards, and green spaces uh, uh, so that folks can enjoy their property. So the Chicago World's Fair was in 1893, which is just a few short years before they really started conceiving the idea of Kingsport. So the planning of the Chicago Expedition, uh, Exposition was directed by Daniel Burnham, who was probably the most famous architect in uh, American history, really, to be honest with you. Um, his name is to architecture as Olmsted is to landscape architecture. So when you hear Burnham and you hear Olmsted, you know that, that is, that's truly American architecture. There were, there were other types and styles, but I mean, America didn't really have one, so he was instrumental in helping uh, come up with an idea for American style. And so he was very influential in like the National Mall in Washington, D.C., for example. So the Grand Exposition in, um, in Chicago displayed a model city. This is not my words, it's their words. Displayed a model city of grand scale known as the White City, marked with monumental symmetry and gilded age splendor, which marked the Im imaginations of American architects who were eager to formulate a new style of architecture unique to the American city. This desire ushered in a new aesthetic called the City Beautiful Movement. So the Chicago World's Fair you see the symmetry there with the, the long, it looks like the National Mall, right? Down below is the Kingsport Town Center plan. That was influenced heavily by that thought process. That is right across the street from where we're standing today. And if you could look out that mirror or window just beyond the fountain, there's a parking lot there, but there was supposed to be a connecting building that was supposed to be City Hall. And then the two flanking wings are now the library and, and it was the utilities company, now it's a bank. But it was supposed to have that connecting piece that never happened. Um, in the 60s, they decided to build the, the City Hall on Center Street instead of finishing the plan because they were concerned about parking. And uh, so when this building became available after the bank left, it made a lot of sense to kind of go back and recapture um, the, the location that was intended, although obviously we'd all love Kingsport Inn to still be here. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, that symmetry was supposed to be these two blocks, and that didn't, that didn't happen. So we didn't always carry through on the plans that they came up with. So again, who are these architects? Clinton McKenzie designed Shelby Row, Park Hill, which is the 50s. His estate is listed on Old Long Island's Gold Coast alongside names like Vanderbilt, Woolworth, Roosevelt, and Chrysler. He was an avid yachtsman and is, he's famous for being part of the decision to deny the English team's protest against the American team, which was led by Vanderbilt. It was the closest that Britain ever came to winning the America's Cup. So do you see any similarities to the houses he designed in Long Island, the Kingsport? The Tudor style house on the bottom? The house on the top is a uh, more of a Spanish style. We'll get to that in just a minute, but there's, there's some influence of that in Kingsport as well. Kingsport Inn, which stood right where we are today, um, was a lovely uh, hotel that was, it was the same scale as what was happening across the street. So if you were standing on the front porch of the, of the Kingsport Inn looking straight across the street, you would be looking down that brick path that leads past the fountain and then the proposed Civic Center or City Hall would have been on the other side that didn't happen. So you, you can begin to see the symmetry of what was intended to be here. So I, a lot of times I share this with high school students uh, so they don't have a clue about what I'm about to say, but why were courtyards so important? I'm probably the last generation that remembers a time before air conditioning, right? So I remember the Lincoln, you know, I went to Lincoln and we had the two courtyards and you could open the windows and every classroom had access to, uh, to air from the outside to get a crosswind. And that was critically important at the time because you didn't have, you didn't have air conditioning. So the courtyards were a, a trademark of, of this, uh, this design. This is what the inn looked like. Um, this is an example of the courtyard. You see the upper rooms with the windows open, the uh, rocking chairs in, in the area in, in the middle. And I just, I look at that and think, gosh, what I what would I give to have that back, you know? But uh, my whole career, people used to tell me that uh, you remember the Kingsport Inn, you remember when they did this? Oh, I can't believe they did that. And then eventually, I found a copy of the last menu, and it was the year I was born. 
And I said, well, no wonder I don't remember it. And I, I, you know, so I don't ever remember there being a building here other than this one. The block houses on Shelby Street were another example. So what they were facing at the time is they were in New York City. And what was happening at that time in New York City? Immigrants were flooding in from everywhere. And they were cramming into four or five story walk up apartments that did not have windows. If you went down the hall in the middle, there were no windows. And they'd have, you know, six, ten people sleeping in. There was no regulations. Uh, there were no, there was no sanitation. There was no, uh, you know, they, they had collective uh, bathrooms. They didn't have bathrooms for each uh, residence. And it was overrun with people. And they were just cramming in any way they could. Um, almost like they were sleeping on a ship. That's what prompted zoning. Uh, early in 1916 is when the first zoning ordinance happened because they were trying to combat those things. Now, I ran into that over here on Sullivan Street, uh, Heath Gwynn's building that he re renovated. I went upstairs, and you go down, there's there's six apartments upstairs. As you go down the hall and you turn into the middle apartments, there's a window, and I remember thinking, where's the window go? You're in the middle of the building. But there's a wet window well. So before air conditioning, you had to be able to open that window. You could step out into the little piece that was over the roof of the apartment downstairs, but it gave you access to air so that you could get some circulation and not just be in a, you know, being cooked to death basically in that middle bedroom. So they, uh, that influenced them heavily. So they were trying to, sh to show I can build worker housing that is decent and desirable and it can meet all different kinds of needs. So they were trying to use different styles. So they had attached homes like the Shelby Street row houses. They called it the block houses. This is actually in a book called Industrial Housing. And it was published in 1920 by Clinton McKenzie. So he was doing these model homes uh, to show. The 50s, he, there are triplexes, there are freestanding homes, there are, it's mixed use. You know, in, in, in those days, mixed use, I mean, it's a common thing for us to have a mixed use zone today, but back in those days, it wasn't that common to have a mixed use zone like that. And, uh, and so that was another example of uh, single and semi-detached housing. Development number three, as they called it, was the Forest and Myrtle Street area, Little White City. This is probably the neighborhood that we have done the least to preserve um, that is re really a part of the original plan. So Forest Street and Myrtle Street is filled with these um, neatly designed Clinton McKenzie homes. Uh, they've been altered over the years uh, in many, many respects, but they were, des they were designed to be very um, attractive single family homes or a modest income. And uh, I remember uh, Tommy Ultraman grew up in that neighborhood, and how do I know that? Because I was his paper boy. So this is what it looked like. You, you remember I told you about the Garden City and the City Beautiful movements. I didn't want grids. So that's why Forest Street has the triangle and it has the, the little curvilinear streets. It's not just a, they could have done a straight street like, a, like a many of the other streets, but they wanted to introduce some sort of interest in the way it was laid out. You can see at the top, 802 Forest Street, uh, that's what it looks like today with the blue metal roof and the gray uh, paint. On the left is the rendering that Clinton McKenzie came up with in 1920. So every one of those houses is architecturally designed. It's a really neat neighborhood, and I think it's one that we just overlooked many times. Three-story flats was another thing that he came up with, and this was up at the intersection of Broad Street and Ravine Road. Um, Markham's Pharmacy just renovated part of the building, or they renovated all, all the building they controlled, but the plan was to build an entire block, but they only built one corner. So if you can see where the red circle is, that's all that got built. But what was supposed to be built was the whole, complete the courtyard the other way around, so they, they, they didn't able to do that. But uh, the pictures on the, the lower, on your lower left, are interior pictures because there are now lofts on the second floor. And those were rented out, and the Markhams have done a fantastic job of renovating the building and renting out the lofts on the top floor. So, again, I'm, I'm glad to see the reinvestment in in these older buildings. Uh, development number four was titled Negro Village. That's hard to say; it's hard to read, but that's what that's what it was described in the book. And uh, the whole idea they didn't get it right, but they were trying to figure it out. Um, they everything was separate but equal back then. So they were trying to build a separate but equal neighborhood. And it was what we know as Borden Village now. But uh, Federal Street, the Circle, they had all the, the variety of housing from the, you know, the upper class housing to the, to the entry level housing. 
Uh, they had churches, schools, everything was designed to be a self-sustaining uh, Negro village. Um, the picture on the left, as you see at the top, is on Birch Street. If you look down below it, you'll notice the roof lines in those two houses. That's the design from Clinton McKenzie. So those houses on Birch Street are still existing to this day, but those were Clinton McKenzie designs, just to give you an idea. Now, what happened to that uh, when they built the Borden plant? They decided they needed company housing for Borden, and so they, they didn't build it for the black community. They came back and said, no, Borden wants it for workers. So they built, they didn't do it. So that's where Riverview came in eventually, but they, it was supposed to be uh, in Borden Village. Broad Street development. Now we've lost several of these homes. Um, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, that's an actual map along Broad Street. And you notice the Dutch colonial sort of barn looking building and you notice in the upper picture, it's still there. That house is gone. You remember when Holston Valley was going through the, the buying up all the houses to build parking? That's, that's where we lost quite a few of those Clinton McKenzie houses. So, um, but that's what, uh, what it would have looked like back in, you know, b beforehand, before the hospital started expanding. Of course, at the time, they thought the idea for a hospital was to put it off the beaten path in a cul-de-sac, you know, and where you could convalesce with clean air and then you know, they needed an emergency room or something and cul-de-sacs and emergency rooms weren't great, great com combo, right? So, uh, they had to start trying to fix the hospital to fit the modern situation. This is on Watauga Street. The house, the picture on the right is a recent picture. The picture on the left is from that 1920 book by Clinton McKenzie. So, you know, they, they did add on um, a porch on the right and they enclosed it. They also closed the porch on the left, but you see it pretty much looks the same as it did in 1920 when the building was built, um, although they have changed some of the clabbered siding. The Federal Club uh, was located at the intersection of Sullivan Street and Wilcox Drive. It is now the Sullivan County Health Department and EMS. That building was demolished. Uh, there are tons of references over the years. It was the Union Club and the Borden Club and the Federal Club. It's where a lot of uh, folks that came to town to work. They boarded there. They met their spouse there. They had, you know, networking dances and all kinds of things. Uh, but it, it just didn't. It didn't survive. And so it's it's another one of those things that's been lost to history. And uh, but wow, what if that building was still there? So who were the famous architects? Grosvenor Atterbury, White City is what he designed. He is known for his interest in standardized housing construction. Um, he's, a, he's noted for Forest Park Hills in Queens. You know, I mentioned earlier Orchard Court was based off, port, um, off of uh, Forest Park Hills. So if you look at the upper left, that's, that's uh, the, the area that looks like Orchard Court in Brooklyn. The lower right is an, an aerial view of that neighborhood. Does that look familiar? Looks like the radial street, doesn't it? Here in Kingsport, but that's in Brooklyn. At Lectus Litchfield, uh, he was a de devotee of municipal beautification and one of the main architects uh, and town planners of a place called York Yorkship Village, which is now called Fairview. It's in Camden, New Jersey, right across from Philadelphia. It was, it, it was built in World War I. Uh, the idea was a place of light rooms and clean yards with adequate playgrounds and amusement fields, a place of beauty and appropriateness and cleanliness cleanliness so great that a man returning from his daily toil would receive new strength and recreation. A place where the man who could save a fraction of his income would be able to obtain with it for himself and for his children a, a share of play and education, literature and music, and other uplifting things. So again, look at that layout on the upper left. It looks a lot like Kingsport, right? And the lower left looks a lot to me like Garden Apartments. Thomas Hastings, um, I think it was Chris McCart was in St. Augustine and sent me a picture, and I didn't know until he sent me that, that Thomas Hastings had done anything in Kingsport. I think he was really disappointed in me, but I didn't know that. So uh, Thomas Hastings' most famous project was the New York Public Library. Um, he also designed the Cannon Office Building for the U.S. House of Representatives and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier uh, in Arlington. His firm also designed projects for the Flagler family, the Ponce de Leon Hotel in St. Augustine, and the hotel uh, Al Alcazar, which is now the Lightning Museum, as, as well as residential projects for Guggenheim, DuPont, Harriman, and Vanderbilt. So uh, he is the one that designed the Civic Center across the street, the library, the utilities, and the future Civic uh, Civic Center that didn't happen. So again, Thomas Hastings, one of the most famous architects in America. So what does the evolution in neighborhoods look like each decade in Kingsport's existence? Real quickly, uh, you know, home building follows road building. I think John Campbell told me that one time. 
And uh, so there was a lot of discussion about how to tra how to transform muddy roads into paved roads that could support development. And that, believe me, was going on well up into the 1920s. So uh, this article from the 1925 Times, Times News said, with the exception of several stretches between Indian Springs and Bluntville, the new Lee Highway has been open to traffic for its full length from Kingsport to Bristol. This road, 18 and 22 feet wide, smooth concrete and a good grade, is one of the best thoroughfares in the entire country. It was 1925. We didn't have a paved road all the way to Bristol. So <laughs> I remember them telling me that my office was in the improvement building and there were four vaults. And so they had the vaults because you had to go to the courthouse in Bluntville and there was no fireproof way to save things. So they had to save them in the vaults here because it took forever to get to Bluntville and back because of the road situation. And uh, that's not exactly the case now, is it? So 1926, um, Times News, real estate in Kingsport is a good buy. You will make no mistake buying real estate in Kingsport. Kingsport's growth is now more rapid and more consistent than it's ever been. Well, until 1929. <laughs> and so I, I often tell folks that, you know, we, you know, we live in a city that faced an Im immense uphill battle in its development. So 1917 was World War I, right? So then 1929, the stock market crashed. Well, that lasted for, that for 10 years in the Great Depression. 1939, World War II started, and then 1941, U.S. entered the war. So the whole first half of Kingsport's existence was, was occurring during world conflict. And uh, many of the things that, that, you know, we inherited as, as city folks is uh, we couldn't use um, materials that were needed for the war for water lines. So you remember Old Faithful used to blow up block by block going down Market Streets because the, it was the wrong material to begin with, but you couldn't, the, the material that was required was needed for the war, so you had to take the backup material. And that was not intended to last as long as it did. So um, it's, it's a lot going on. But if you ever think we have a problem, talk to the Oak Ridge city manager. Uh, he was telling us one time that they were going back and trying to forensically figure out where all the underground pipes and things went because the army just built the town. They didn't worry about, you know, getting planning commission to approve it or anything. They just put it in and then said, okay, it's yours now. And there's stuff that goes under houses and under buildings and all kinds of things. So remember the Spanish style house I showed you earlier uh, from New York? Here's an example, Grenada Court um, from 1925. And there's what, five or six houses right in a row just across from Lee School or Cora Cox Academy that meet that description. Again, this is from 1926, Brickyard Row. I found this, um, these houses shown on a map and of uh, when you went straight across uh, Cherokee Street and then uh, it turned to the left and there was a row of houses and they called it Brickyard Row. And again, tomorrow there's gonna be another announcement that there's gonna be another uh, version of Brickyard and I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. Holston Heights uh, went up to Cement Hill. Um, this is from a 1914 Bristol paper. Now, again, 1917 was Kingsport, so this is before Kingsport existed. So 1914, they were talking about a Halloween party. On last Saturday evening, the Clinchfield Club in Holston Heights entertained a number of guests at their annual Halloween party. Uh, music was furnished by the Johnson City Orchestra and dancing was engaged in until late hour. You know, so, yeah. Radial Streets. Um, Center Street, West Sullivan Street, Catawba, and Watery. These are Sears home kits. So from 1908 to 1940, Sears entered the housing business. And you can go and find these online and, and you can match them up all across America to houses that match that floor plan. So in the 1930s, during the Depression, um, they stopped uh, doing this because folks couldn't pay their bills. So they finally stopped in 1940 providing Sears houses. But up until you know that that uh, 1908 to 19 say 30, and then the last 10 years being a decline, um, you could drive around any community in America and find these Sears hit houses. Because remember, back in those days, when you built a house, you were pretty much starting from scratch. This was pretty much a production built house. It was pre measured, pre cut. It was sent on a box car. You unloaded it, took it to your site, and put it together. So you know, it was a, a, rap, a way to accommodate the. Uh, that rapidly grown population and keep up with housing. Borden Village and Lynn Garden, these are more Sears houses. I mean, you can look all over Borden Village and Lynn Garden and see these kinds of house styles, these small bungalows you know, with a front porch. Westview Park, um, notice the dotted line there. So the dotted line at the top 
which is basically Lake Street, um, was the city limits up until 1999. 1989, sorry. Um, and Westview School, which you see sitting out here in the middle of the pasture, is now Theodore Roosevelt School. But that was a picture from 1938, what it looked like. So when you try to drive back and forth between Westview and Severe Terrace, and you scratch your head because these houses are this old and these houses are that old, that's what it looked like when they started building Severe Terrace. Again, back to these fire insurance maps. Notice that um, up here, can you see it at all? Gosh, it's very big. But right in here, this red circle is New Street. And you notice there's a house sitting right in the middle of New Street because it didn't connect to Cherokee. Because Cherokee and all the streets to the east were intended to be residential streets. You can see there's houses lined up in a row down all those streets. Now, some of those houses still exist to this day, one of which used to be a carriage house recently on Center Street. Eleanor Eason's old office, those, some of those, those were houses that were intended to be houses. So downtown Kingsport was supposed to end at Cherokee Street. From Cherokee over was supposed to be residential. When you start thinking about downtown today, it's a much larger footprint than was ever intended. Also, Mission Street, which um, kind of stubs out where Lee Apartments used to be, Sullivan Street over to Dell Street, it's labeled on this map as Watery Street because Watery Street was supposed to go all straight through and connect and up to the, the, the original Dobbins Bennett High School. Pulp Village and Extract Village, um, these are houses that recently been renovated by the Phillips family. They did a fantastic job, but it's a great example of what 1920s architecture will look like in Kingsport. Edgewood and Beechwood, these, uh, the parking lot in front of the personnel area at Eastman off Lincoln Street is where Edgewood uh, used to be. And then Beechwood was pretty, pretty much where the AEP power plant uh, is located at the end of Sherwood Road. That, that general area is where Beechwood would have been. Both of those were um, housing to support Eastman. A part of Beechwood Village was also impacted by the John B. Dennis expansion. Borden Village, again, uh, 100 new homes announced here by the Borden plant. And those homes were organized based on where you fit in the management order of, of Borden. So the bigger houses go to the higher paid folks and, and vice versa. But they all live together in, in a corporate village there. Severe Terrace, I uh, thought this was interesting from 1927 Times News. The sale uh, will be of special significance due to the fact that the, sorry, that the lots are located on one of Kingsport's most desirable residential sections, which face the Lee Highway. Back in 1991, when I was doing 911 for the city, we had to make sure all the street names were correct. I can't tell you how many variations of West Sullivan Street, Lee Highway, and Knoxville Highway we still had on the records at that time, and never in my lifetime had I ever known anything in Kingsport to be called Lee Highway, but it sure was. And it went all the way from New Orleans up through Virginia. So again, I mentioned earlier that they were really struggling with how you deal with the race issue. And so uh, there were many references to the colored section. And again, I say that's hard to say, it's hard to read in this day and time, but again, they were trying to figure it out. And so there was quite a bit of, of uh, effort put toward making sure that there were equal opportunities. And uh, so I noticed that, for example, on the lower left, it says colored section 10, 1026 and 1019 Walnut Street. Well, Walnut Street is now Severe Avenue. So if you look over to the right, that's that same house in 2023 that was built in 1933 or 35. Um, they talked about Negro Scouting Program. They talked about working with the various pastors of all black churches. Um, and then they had uh, in the matinee section, they had references to even um, colored seating available. So again, while that's very unpalatable by today's standards, they were trying to figure it out. And uh, I, I thought it was pretty neat on the bottom right. It says, uh, Mrs. J. Fred Johnson will be the chairman of Post 5 located in the colored section of Kingsport. Mrs. W.C. Pechtel, Mrs. Charles Gibson, and Mrs. R.L. Peters will uh, be the, the white aides. Colored aides will be Ms. Ellen Howell, V.O. Dobbins, James Stafford, uh, Louise Leach, Horace Sneed, is that right? In the back of the room here. Uh, Mrs. Lee Walton, Mrs. Will Patton, Mrs. Cora Griffith, and Mrs. Helen Stafford and Virginia Phipps. So again, they were trying to figure out how to, to make that work. And I thought 
Uh, one of the advertisements I saw was talking about you could anybody could have a victory garden if you were the Kingsport Development Company would give you property to do a victory garden. And they, they made it very clear and put it in big, it doesn't matter, black or white, you all get one. And so I thought that was pretty neat and very progressive for the time. Glenwood Heights, again, this is out, um, remember Memorial Boulevard, uh, Highway 126, which was originally Highway 11W. Um, they offered new subdivisions uh, for sale. Near Glenwood Church, we sold to the public um, by C.A. Harris. Now, where's Jane? There you go. So that's your family, right? So, yeah, Jane Harris. Um, 100 lots, but only will be off, uh, 50 will be offered for sale. And Glenwood Heights is owned by W.R. Jennings, S.C. Minnick, and T.R. Bandy. So that's Fort Robinson Realty, I believe, right? Um, and then if you go to the west side of town, now there's a, there, of course, there's Jennings Drive and there's Minnick Trail that leads up to Tractor Supply. So that family was involved in real estate for a long time. Top, the house on the top is a current condition. It was built in 1939, recently sold for $103,000. And then the house below is on the old Dixon School property. So uh, Joe Begley bought that site and uh, demolished the school that was beyond repair. It is now retrofitted with um, many single-family homes that are one level. Um, that one recently sold in 2022 for $399.9. So um, Blitz Manor and Warpath. Uh, I mentioned earlier about J. Fred Johnson and his relationship with uh, Mr. Litz. Um, so in 1935, Warpath School burnt to the ground. The loss is estimated at $1,300, and it's the oldest county school. So Warpath Drive is the oldest county school. So my question to myself was, which came first, Warpath or Conrock? You know, and so Warpath was clearly the old name. I actually found references to a post office called Warpath, Tennessee, where um, the Bradleys, the head Bradley Brothers Construction, um, one of the daughters had been corresponding with Chattanooga, and uh, their children actually saw it from Colorado and, and uh, all across the country, and they confirmed that that was, in fact, the case, that Warpath was considered a town or a, a post office at the time. So when Warpath School burnt down, that's when J. Fred Johnson got involved and said, we, we've got to have a school out here. So the county built a new school called Litz Manor School. The Litz Manor School got built, um, but then uh, in the 1950s, the city had grown to Green Acres and had built Andrew Johnson and annexed Litz Manor, and so there was no need for Litz Manor School anymore. So all those kids went to Andrew Johnson, and so Litz Manor School was torn down, and they built this uh, subdivision that you see on the lower left. Those houses were built in 1960, but the rest of the houses of the neighborhood were built in 1940. That's why there's a 20-year difference because the 1960s houses were built where the school used to be. So Lawndale and Wooddale and part of uh, Bruce Street uh, is where Litz Manor School used to be. So um, I thought that was a pretty cool story. A little Fair Acres, I love this, drive out to Fair Acres. Like it's way out. <laughs> so Kingsport's uh, newest and most beautiful residential district. So again, some of these are still Sears home kits. So if you look at the bottom right, then you look to the left. The left is an existing house in Fair Acres, and the, the um, model is on the right from Sears home kits. So uh, you know, they, again, there, there's a, a wide variety of architectural styles throughout the Fair Acres area. Bellevue, also on East Center Street, indications uh, indications pointed today to Kingsport's huge construction program being carried well into the year 1938. As an announcement was made that property located at the east of Highland Park on Highway 11W has been divided into home sites. Owners of the Bellevue addition, comprising about 65 acres on the north side of the highway, said yesterday the property had been subdivided into 226 lots facing nine streets, including in the development each street 50 feet wide. And these two homes that are shown are recent examples of homes that just sold in the Bellevue area. I remember uh, Shirley Britt. Anybody know Shirley Britt? So, you know, I, I didn't I didn't put a fine distinction on where Highland Park and Bellevue and and you know all these subtle keys to me. Kind of like I call Bloomingdale everything from Stone Drive out to Arcadia is Bloomingdale to me. But no, don't they don't have that conversation with someone in Bloomingdale. They'll quickly explain where Cedar Grove starts and stops, and you know where Kingsley starts and stops, and all this kind of stuff. So, but Shirley would would fight you. She lived in Bellevue. She did not live in Highland. And she didn't leave in Dixon Edition or any place else. She lived in Bellevue, and so so I always remember that. 
Oak Grove was just across the street from uh, the intersection of Memorial Boulevard and Center Street as we know it today. Uh, it, it centered around Miller Street, and I noticed down the lower left-hand side that the developer was Henry Miller. So I guess that he named it after himself. And if you look at the bottom left, those are two houses, one built in 1938, uh, actually both built in 1938, and one recently sold for 229.6, and the other one sold for 144. And you see how it's been renovated, the one in the lower uh, middle. So I really love to see these old neighborhoods being uh, in, being shown some love and renovated. Ridgeway was just to the east of Oak Grove, and uh, I believe, in this where the four sisters grew up, maybe Ashley Street and Ridge, Ridgeway. So, uh, so this is Ashley and Ridgeway, and um, it's called Ridgeway Edition. And so the two houses on the bottom center are an example of what you might find in that area. Built in 1938 and 1940, one just recently sold for 210, and the other one sold for 153. Would you look at those gleaming hardwood floors in the middle? That's you just can't get that kind of craftsmanship anymore. Riverview. So I remember I said that um, Borden Village was supposed to be the black community, and so they came back and decided to build um, Riverview on the other side of the tracks, which is pretty tacky, but they did, and um, they were doing the defense homes, which is the homes along Carolina Avenue, Pinola, the, brick, the speed brick homes. And so they did similar homes in Riverview. So if you pay close attention, you can pick those out in the Riverview neighborhood to this day. Um, and they named the, uh, they did the public housing. Robert E. Lee homes was for the white community and Riverview was for the black community. Again, but that stuff is hard to say, but it is a part of our history that if we don't remember it, we'll doom to repeat it. Fort Robinson was west of uh, west of what is now I-26. Uh, 1942 is when the Fort Robinson addition took place. Moore and Walker. We were just talking about that, Sharon, weren't we? <laughs> I'm Fuller and Hillman, and <laughs> I've eaten more than Walker. Walker. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's two houses as an example that are in Fort Robinson addition right now. One just sold for 195. That was built in 1961, and then we've had some new additions that have been built. This was built in, in 2020 on Union Street. And just sold for two hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. So, Oakwood Forest um, was the Kingsport firm was incorporated, called Oakwood Forest Incorporated. Um, it was uh, the incorporators were Glenn Bruce, Alan Dryden, and E.G. Hunter. Uh, that's why I was asking Jennifer earlier if her hunters connect back here, and that's they don't. But uh, they formed a corporation to build this neighborhood. And as an example, a couple of the homes that just sold recently, one was built in nineteen fifty that just sold for three hundred and five thousand. And the one down below is on Oakwood Street that just sold for 265 built in 1948. But that's over right behind uh, what used to be Oakwood Forest Christian Church. I think they've changed the name just recently. So Bay's View of the speed bricks. Um, the defense homes, have, they were trying to figure out how to house all the veteran, veterans that were returning from war. So they were trying to build these brick homes as quickly as possible. There was a plan that um, Bulova was involved with from New York that um, was going to invest in what's called Winston Terrace, and it was going to be the South's largest development. And they only got the 1,600 blocks of uh, severe Pinola and Carolina built before the war broke out. And so if you notice a distinct difference in the 1,600 blocks of those streets I just named versus the 1,500 and 1,400 blocks, they have eventually just sold all the remaining lots to the Kingsport Defense Homes, and, and they built the speed bricks. Where Winston Terrace was going to be, so you know some of those houses on the 1600 block of Pinola are they're two story or one and a half story, um, they're wood frame. They're, it's a different architectural style, and so when you try to figure out well, where in the world is Bayview, look at those blue dots. It's all over around Lincoln School. It's around the Garden Apartments, and then it goes out um, Carolina Pinola and uh, Severe Avenues. Westwood Hills, um, this is also an extension of Ashley Street off of uh, Port Henry Drive. Westwood Hills on the Johnson City Highway, five bedroom uh, or five room frame houses complete with built-in hardwood oak floors for $5,850. Boy, wouldn't that be nice these days, right? So here's a couple of examples that just sold. One sold for $226,350, built in 1950, and another one in 1947 that just sold for $154. But again, still a very desirable neighborhood and still people reinvesting in that community. Forest Hills out in Colonial Heights. Um, now, the Fort Patrick Henry Lake was just getting started in the early 1950s, so you're starting to see housing go out there. Um, and this is along uh, Colonial Heights Road. This house was built in 1953, uh, a ranch-style home which was with a carport, which was a major thing at the time. 
That one just sold for two twenty three, or excuse me, two hundred twenty two thousand dollars. And look at the interior, how beautiful that looks. Ridgefields. This comes from the Library of Congress, which I thought was pretty cool to find Kingsport and Ridgefields mentioned in the Library of Congress. So these were the Olmsted Associates. Remember, I mentioned earlier that Olmsted and Burnham were the most famous architect and landscape architect names. So uh, Olmsted was hired to lay out Ridgefields, and the way you got to Ridgefields at that time was the ferry. So the centerpiece was Pendragon. It was much later that they built the bridge where Ridgefields Road is, and so if it seems kind of odd that all of the civic, you know, stuff like the country club and the golf course and all that is on a dead end, it wasn't always on a dead end. It was at the main entrance at one point. And, uh, and if you look at that layout that you see on the lower left and you put it over a current layout of Ridgefields, it is pretty close. There's a few streets that didn't get built, but most of it's pretty close to what actually got built. And uh, so when I take folks from out of town and they see Ridgefields to this day and they can walk out on the back porch and see the golf course and the mountain in the background, they, they can't believe that that is a possibility, you know, in our area, that, that that's so well designed. But that's what the value of good design does for you. It carries on forever. Um, the Oaks from Acorn saying has been proved once again from an idea in the minds of a few forward-looking people has grown a new residential subdivision which Kingsport views with pride. I'm speaking of Ridgefields. Of course, where the first new homes are now nearing completion. City water is available, and the subdivision has been approved for FHA home financing, and more new roads are about to be added. The country club and swimming pool will be in operation this summer, and long-range plans include complete shopping center. And ask Bennett and Edwards about your Ridgefield home site. So uh, Ridgefield wasn't in the city until the 1960s. So for a long time, it was, it was outside the city, but it had the sprawling, you know, you look at these, and they're deceiving from the front because it's, it looks like they're one-story homes, but from the back, it's where they put the golf course. So you get the two-story and the beautiful view, and it really is, it's very deceiving. And those houses, of course, to this day are going from 560 to 396. And these are a few, th these prices are a few years old. I mean, now they're gotten even more inflated, I guess. Dorna Court was built along Warpath Drive, and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, reinvestment in that area. So this would have been um, in the 1950s, early 1950s. Um, these ranch style homes, uh, here's an example on the lower left, just sold for 246 420 One of the houses on Warpath Drive. And uh, another one right beside it sold for 244 both built in 1954. So again, you're, you're seeing, if you haven't been in the housing market like I haven't been looking for a house in a while, it may surprise you at what houses are going for and what is going on inside in terms of remodeling and modernization. Uh, Lake Crest, uh, 1958 59 was, was added. That's, uh, uh, right there behind Ingalls going toward the Mead cabins. Um, those houses were, are selling recently for 120 to 234. Patrick Henry Heights was located, uh, right there on, um, Walton Circle near Warriors Path. Again, that's, everything was going toward the lake. And if you look at that bottom right, look at that knotty pine. That was all the rage back then. And uh, I think a lot of people painted it, but, Luckily, these folks did, and they appreciated the, the craftsmanship. Hemlock Park happened in 1954 and 55. Um, they're selling for the mid 600s at this point. And then midfields to the northwest. Uh, I love that retro font on the upper left-hand corner that appeared in the newspaper in 1955, and you could get a house for $9,350 back in those days. Um, but even midfields up in the northwest corner, these two these two pictures are the same house, but it was built in 1963. And you see how it's been uh, modernized and updated and sold for 364.9. Then Patton Heights was built in uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, but that that would be the area along Afton Street into the west. And you see more of the I call Brady Bunch homes, the trip tri levels, um, so selling recently for 310 and 179. Green Acres, 1958. I thought this was interesting when you look at the upper left hand corner. Uh, follow this how to get there map to the Medallion Home. Uh, light conditioning is recommended by the American Home Lighting Association. Adequate wiring for full house power. Comfort conditioning with all electric heat pump. Full quote of time and work, uh, let's see, work saving elect electrical appliances. So they were just introducing electricity into houses at that time. And so that was a big deal. And it's something that we take advantage of, or take for granted now that was happening there in the early 50s. Severe Terrace. Uh, those houses also early 50s. The house on the bottom is uh, on Putnam Street, 
just off of Morrison Avenue. And uh, look how they have thoughtfully renovated that house and uh, what they've done with it and sold for 260 recently. So what I'm doing now is the Move to Kingsport program, and I get to share these stories with folks that are considering moving here. It kind of keeps me busy, keeps me out from underfoot and, and out, uh, out from bothering uh, the city manager. But we have recently been named as a Wall Street Journal number seven top emerging market in the winter of 2023, okay? So why is that? Because the Wall Street Journal says that people are looking for smaller markets, healthy economies, and easy commutes. They're looking for an affordable refuge from high costs. And while some of those numbers may sound high to us, if you're from outside the area, there are very low prices compared to what they're accustomed to. And so we're starting to see much more of an influx. And so we've, we've seen more than 2,000 people move here in the past couple of years uh, from out of state, from all 50 states. Uh, ha the housing market uh, also, this is GoBankingRates.com. These 15 cities are poised for the most stable growth and are likely to keep their value. And you see Knoxville, Kingsport, and Johnson City mentioned among those other cities nationwide. So again, these are things that we can't control, uh, but national interest is starting to realize what we've got going on here, and it's a pretty special place. So I'll end it there, and I would just encourage you, if you're interested in more stories, to follow me at kingsportspirit.com. I'm happy to take any questions if we still have time, or I'm gonna hang around afterwards if you'd like to talk more privately. Any questions? Well, thank you all so much for coming. Appreciate you. Uh -huh. Yeah, Bill yeah. That's the, oh, yeah. that's the house I saw. I met you before. Yeah, and well, you used to kind of know him. Well, he was on the planning commission. Yep. So um, let me turn this microphone off. Hey, the. Um